Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so welcome to the fourth annual Benjamin Drummond Emancipation Day celebration. My name is Charita Jacobs Thompson, and I help organize and co produce the series with Mary Ann Brownlow. And so let me start off by asking a quick question. How many of you are in the building for the first time today? Okay. Welcome, and we hope that you will look at our calendar of events and come back over and over and over and over again. So welcome. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, can everyone take a moment and silence your cell phones for us? And also you have surveys on your chairs and we would really like for you to take a moment after the program and fill those out. Those are very helpful for us as we plan for future programs. So without further delay, I want to introduce our panel for the evening here to discuss African American women, a history of sexual violence and trauma. So first we have Dr. Nikki Taylor who is professor of history and chair of the history department at Howard University. She specializes in 19th century African-American history and her subspecialties are in urban African-American and intellectual history. Uh, she has a book, which I'm sure she'll be happy to sign after the event is over, but her first book was Frontiers of Freedom, Cincinnati's Black Community, 1802 to 1868. And then we have her second book, uh, America's First Black Socialist, The Radical Life of Peter H. Clark. And then the book that we have for sale this evening is Driven Toward Madness, The Fugitive Slave, Margaret Garner, and Tragedy on the Ohio. Uh, Dr. Taylor's current research project is on women who participated in armed slave revolts. And then we also have Dr. Jean Theo Harris, who is Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Brooklyn College of City University of New York, and the author and co-author of seven books, numerous articles on the civil rights um, and black power movements, uh, the politics of race and education, social, social welfare and civil rights in post 9-11 America, her widely acclaimed biography, which is also for sale, and she will be happy to sign after the program, The Rebellious Life of Miss Rosa Parks which won a 2014 NAACP Image Award and the uh, um, Association, uh, actually the Lolita Woods Brown Award from the Association of Black Women Historians. It appeared on the New York Times bestseller list and was named one of the 25 best academic titles of 2013 by choice. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, MSNBC, The Nation, Slate, Salon, The Intercept, and The Chronicle of Higher Education. Her latest book, A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil War History, came out. I had it coming out in January, so it is out. Yes. Right? Okay, through Beacon Press. And our moderator for this evening is Marcia Davis, who is the Washington, Washington Post Magazine editor and writer. Welcome to all of you, and please help me give them a round of applause. <laughs> okay, so I get to start. Um, and what I'd like to do is ask a general question about why are we now just hearing more about women and sexual violence, African-American women? So we'll take both, both of you. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> well, I think the field of Black women's history itself is relatively new. And so it's not even 30 years old. And so I think that uh, with each successive generation of historians of Black women history, we begin to probe deeper into a lot of the issues affecting African Americans. And I think the issue of sexual violence uh, before now maybe was a bit untouchable. And especially when you dig deeper back into slave histories. And so I think with the introduction of works by people like Angela Davis and Deborah Gray White decades ago now, we, we're starting to hear more about uh, this topic. Okay. I mean, I think one of the exciting things, changes, I think, has been also much more recently much more awareness about kind of this long history of resistance. Um, and I think most recently when Oprah at the Golden Globes, I think made a very concerted point of saying the Me Too movement has these much longer antecedents in 
in kind of the organizing and kind of testifying of black women against sexual violence and that these organizing campaigns, as we're going to talk about tonight, become kind of some of the bedrock of the civil rights movement. And, and I think in the past, maybe decade, we've begun to kind of really under, like see that history more clearly. Uh, but I think it, it sort of got put into the public in a much more vivid way with Oprah's speech at the Golden Globes. Okay. All right. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, um, about that presence in terms of Oprah, for example, and how she brought that, that forward more? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how many people sort of saw the clip of, yeah. So, I mean, I think what she was doing was, I mean, I think we're in a very kind of exciting moment where um, in a much uh, bigger way, and I think I'm gonna date myself here, but I mean, certainly Anita Hill led the way um, 25 years ago and kind of, I think, changed the conversation. But yeah. certainly what we're seeing this year is, a much wider public conversation. But what I think Oprah wanted, did um, was t she talked about uh, the rape of Recy Taylor in 1944 and Rosa Parks' activism around that. And I think very determinedly, I think, wanted to say, you know, don't you dare think this starts last year or don't you dare think this starts with like, you know, there's a lot of courage that we've seen in the past few years, but this courage is is long standing and this courage in many ways came from African American women. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think it was a very political point uh, that she was trying to make. Yeah, well, um, I think that it's important to underscore the idea that the fact that African American women have long led this uh, battle against uh, rape and, and sexual violence. And so this is centuries in the making. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just, I'm, I'm very relieved that the Me Too movement and activists like Tarana Burke have amplified and uh, underscored some of the things that we've been doing for hundreds of years in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about the pre-Civil War mm -hmm. and what that period was like for African Americans? Yeah, uh, in general, or African American women? Women. Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, um, African American women, especially enslaved women, were, were if you have a, a spectrum of power, so to speak, on one end of the spectrum, you have powerful white men, many of them slaveholders, although not all of them. Um, they're, uh, you know, powerful socially, economically, in terms of the law, the law is set up to uh, endorse and protect their power. At the other end of the spectrum, you have enslaved African American women many of whom had uh, you know, very little personal power in the terms that they weren't able to read or write. And so in addition to that, they didn't have any economic power. They're caught in a matrix of patriarchy and racism. And so many of them, you know, it, it's like they're the exact opposite end of the spectrum as, as, as powerful white men. And so in addition to that, uh, one of the things that uh, one second. One of the things that made it even more uh, uh, difficult for them was that the law protected the powerful, and so one of the things that's interesting about the slave era is that there, how rape was defined by law, it was uh, force, uh, any kind of carnal knowledge of a woman by force, and then on a state basis, some of the states went as far as to uh, say on a white woman. And so that meant that African-American women were absolutely powerless, unprotected, and legally unrapeable in the eyes of the law. Mm. In fact, in the time where my, my last book, from the beginning of our uh, uh, arrival here in the US until the late 19th century, it wasn't even a crime to rape a black woman. It wasn't against the law. So of course, slave owners could do it with impunity, as could any other white men who happen to work on the farm or plantation. And in addition to that, even black men could rape black women with, imp with impunity. And so in a, in a, in a society like that, uh, the only protection African-American women had often was their own might, their own hands, their own feet. 
And so, uh, you know, it's it a really difficult moment in terms of uh, living day to day, knowing that the, the, the threat of rape was constant and ubiquitous. And so, you know, it's definitely really difficult to, to, to really think and, and write history that has one group full of all kinds of power and the other group with, with abject powerlessness. Okay. Um, do you have anything to add to that in terms of just the history? Um, so my specialty is much more in the 20th century. Right. Yeah. So I, um, I mean, I could jump us into the 20th century, um, <laughs> but, but maybe we should, we can get there in a minute. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so was there any kind of law at all for black women at, you know, at all? Well, like I said, the, the general law of rape is carnal knowledge of, of a woman, you know, by force and against her will. And so on a state by state basis, uh, many of the southern states in particular added the word white. But um, locally, sometimes there might be uh, certain magistrates who might, you know, at least go as far as to have the person arrested. But for the most part, black women, if they were to be protected by the law, it would be under the statutes against trespassing. Since we were considered property then for a man to rape a black woman in that sense, and that would be a crime of trespass and not of rape. And so that would take, in order for that to be prosecuted, a powerful white man would have to bring the charges against the, the perpetrator. And then only then there are standards at, that had to be met for the black woman to get justice. And the standards would be, uh, is it believable? Does the mag magistrate believe the charges? Does society writ large believe that this black woman was raped by a, black, uh, by a white man? And then the jury is another standard. And so for the most part, uh, almost without exception, even uh, people who were arrested of such crimes, or it's not even legally a crime, but who were arrested for such um, you know, offenses would find themselves you know, um, able to get you know, out of such charges because of the standards. And then, you know, in addition to that, African American women then and now are fighting against a very pernicious stereotype that of the Jezebel or the oversexed temptress. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Jezebel as a stereotype is, is probably the long, the longest, oldest, most pernicious stereotype facing Black women. And it's, I argue, one of the main reasons why people are reluctant to believe Black women's cries of rape then and now. And so this idea that somehow uh, they tempted their uh, rapist into to, you know, committing such offenses against her. So it, it was just really a, a really sad and troubling time for African Americans. I want to say too that uh, African American women, when they were abused in such ways, it wasn't just a crime against them as a person. Their entire family felt the weight of such rapes. The husband, their parents, their children. Uh, so, so it was in in all aspects uh, that you would consider. Uh, it was just a horrific circumstance for African American women at the time. All right. So now, let's talk a little <laughs> bit about. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that you began to see in the 20th century is, um, and we can talk in a second about the sort of campaigns of resistance against this, is also police raping black women. Um, and so both the law not considering the rape of black women rape, but also literally law enforcement being, um, in a number of the cases, um, so I'm going to talk about Rosa Parks all night. I could talk about Rosa Parks forever, um, but many of the cases that Rosa Parks and her sort of comrades in Montgomery are working on are cases involving rape by police of black women. Mm. Um, and uh, so, I mean, if we're, that it becomes, I mean, normalized and legalized in different kinds of ways. Um, and so trying to imagine how you then build a case against to build like, when a, and when it's a police officer, um, and 
uh, or you know somebody in law enforcement um, and many of those cases right people will will struggle for years and, and not see any justice and again they will be the kind of early precursor to what we think of as the modern civil rights movement mm -hmm. um, um, a number of these cases but but many of them are by police mm -hmm. Can I jump in sure, right here? And I, I, I don't want to leave this audience with the idea that between slavery and the Reese Taylor Rosa Parks activism, that you know the raping of black women stopped. And no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean that inner inner period yes. was was absolutely uh, devastating because black women, although free, uh, were sent into the homes by by economic necessity into the homes of uh, powerful yeah. white white families and oftentimes would be raped with impunity because the laws, even though the laws are going to start to be on the books ostensibly to protect them, you know, again, the enforcement was, was a little uh, lacking and, and less than uh, sufficient in terms of justice. And so this has been, you know, some would argue that uh, a, a parallel to what happened to black men in terms of lynching, especially after the Civil War. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was an equivalent, um, it, it did just as much damage to black women as mm -hmm. lynching did to black men. And, and so people are uneasy about about that parallel, but, but I think that that's something we need to begin to really right. emphasize. Right, so I mean, it's used in chilling ways. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just to give one example, um, in 1944 in Montgomery, a woman by the name of Viola White um, refuses to give up her seat on the bus and uh, is arrested and decides to pursue her case. And in response, police rape her daughter, mm. right? And in many ways, it's a kind of, I mean, that if we think about part of what lynching is, <laughs> right, is, the, is violence against um, often but not only black men who are, you know, sometimes it's for people who are too political or too economically successful, that, that rape becomes a tool similarly for sort of chilling and quieting um, sort of black women who are uh, either speaking out or in other ways um, expanding the realm of um, possibility or freedom. So, um, so just I just wanted to echo that like I think if we understand lynching to be about sending a community a message, right, rape works that way as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, can you talk a little bit about each of you, first you with Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner, um, um, many of you have heard the, the name of the book Beloved by Toni Morrison. And so Beloved, the character that the book was based off of was a real, actual black woman by the name of Margaret Garner. Mm -hmm. And Margaret Garner was enslaved in Northern Kentucky. Uh, and for historians of slavery, we might think, oh, well, Kentucky couldn't have been as bad as deep, <laughs> deep Mississippi or Louisiana. But for Margaret Garner, it was. And so it's not the, the, the degree to which slavery is bad, I argue in my book. It has nothing to do with the kind of crop you pick in the field. It had everything to do with the character of your owner. And so Margaret Garner, uh, she encountered some kind of brutality, some soul breaking trauma that forced her and her entire intact family, her husband, her four children, she was pregnant, and her in-laws to escape slavery on a January night in 1856. And it was 16 miles to the free state of Ohio. And they walked all night. It took them the entire night. Uh, they had a broken down horse, but they had so many children. And, and so they crossed the river when, when it was uh, frozen solid on ice, which is why a lot of uh, slaves at that time escaped in the winter. As soon as she got to Cincinnati, her owner caught up with her. Uh, he's out with a self-styled posse. They start battering in the door. And out of desperation, out of just you know, the fear of returning to that life, she picks up her two-year-old and slits its throat, mm. nearly decapitating the girl. Mm. She takes, uh, she tries to cut the throats of the two oldest boys, but they fight back. 
and then she picks up a heavy coal shovel. Um, many of you, maybe not in DC, but winters are used, big coal shovel to chop the ice, a shovel that big and bashes her nine month old baby in the head with a coal shovel. The little girl survived, but mm. um, I talk about this in the book and I'm, I'm revisiting the trauma of slavery and the hidden traumas that are marked by sexual violence. Uh, her two youngest daughters, uh, by all accounts, the newspapers at the time were obsessed with their color. And so there was a lot of whispering about the possibility that her owner had been the father and she had made, uh, she was very determined about killing those two in particular. So it's a really uh, troubling book, but I think what it teaches us, it, again, it reminds us that slavery was full of horrors and full of, of traumas that are not necess necessarily uh, leaving scars, although she did have those as well. Uh, and, but it, it also is a story of black resistance to slavery mm -hmm. um, and the desire to hold on to that family intact. And so I, I interrogate what that means for a black family to grapple with the result and the product of sexual violence. Um, what does it do to black manhood? And so these are all the questions that I answer in this book. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the family in, mm -hmm. in terms of men and yeah. grandparents? Well, and yeah, because I mean, it's unusual. Many of you have always heard the narrative that slavery destroyed families. So it was unusual. They had on two farms, all of these people were employed, uh, uh, living on two separate farms within the same vicinity in Kentucky. And so Margaret was effectively, though, a single parent on one plantation, or it was a farm, not a plantation. And then on the other one, her husband lived with his parents. Now, uh, the husband was hardly ever there. He was hired out, which was, we call that uh, hired out, but it's really renting. So if an owner didn't have enough money, he would rent his slaves out to other uh, people who needed them on a seasonal basis. Uh, his father had been separated from the family for 30 years. And so he had just returned that previous uh, uh, fall. And so the family had already weathered so many fractures. And so if you look at the story, just like, oh, this family is escaping together, it, it looks maybe positive and hopeful. But if you dig deep into the, the, the family, you see there's a lot of uh, collective and compounded traumas. Uh, from separation, from abuse. The, Margaret's mother-in-law had borne so many children and she just didn't know where most of them were. And so um, when they get to Cincinnati, where I, where I really start to amplify Black manhood, is that the men, especially Simon, Margaret's husband, he tried his best to protect his family, including the children that he possibly suspected were not his, his, his children. And so he had a gun and he shot at a crowd of white men, which was exceptional mm -hmm. in Ohio at that time. You, you're you're going to certainly be killed for doing that in 1856. And, um, you know, it was a very brutal struggle. And, and in that struggle of him trying to protect his family, that's when Margaret slipped away and did what she did. And so, you know, it, it's just all of these overlapping stories. I talk about the family unit. I talk about black manhood. I talk about what does it mean to be a black woman in the age of slavery? How does that then negate your womanhood, your motherhood, all the things that, you know, we value if we look at essentialist notions of womanhood. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a troubling book. I had a colleague that told me that uh, this is a short book, an easy read. And she says, well, you know, Nikki, I think that topic is a little too deep. I, I don't like sad books. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this was another black woman. And I said, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty sad. You know, we have to confront this history. So it's not anything I made up. It's a real story. We have to confront it to learn important lessons about the strength of the black family, the strength of the human spirit, all of these things that have you know, troubled the past of African Americans. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, men and other members of families in terms of dealing with rape as well? Right, I mean, 
So it the the possibility of rape, right, just circles around all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so both in some of the cases that I talk about in the book um, that Rosa Parks and her uh, fellow activists in the Montgomery NAACP work on in the 40s and 50s, um, you know, part of these cases are cases where these women are married, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Recy Taylor is married. Right. Um, and, um, and so, and she has a brother. Uh, and so the kind of what it does, right? And then the courage to kind of come forward and to sort of, to talk about it, to be willing to testify to it um, and, and, and what it does to your family. Um, and then sort of interesting with, with Rosa Parks. So Rosa Parks papers, uh, you know, a, a bunch of her papers opened at the Library of Congress a few years ago. I don't know if people remember this. Um, Howard Buffett, they'd been caught in this whole dispute about her estate and Howard Buffett bought the papers and donated them to the Library of Congress. And in those papers is an 11 page account where it seems like Rosa Parks in her late teens uh, was doing domestic work um, and she is almost raped by a neighbor of the family that she works for. Um, and it, the document is actually a story of her resistance to this man um, and this kind of decision to resist and basically to say to him, you're gonna have to rape my dead body and, um, and just basically just saying to him over and over and over, no, I don't, I won't do this, I won't do this. And then in the, in the document, he does, he backs off. Mm -hmm. um, the white man. Um, it's a white man who's the neighbor of the family she works for um, and who is led in the house by a black man who works there. So the document is also an indictment of this black man who works there and the ways that he gives access to this white man. And then this white man at some point then starts to offer the black man. And she's like, I don't want him. I hate him. And literally she says, I hate him too. Mm. Um, and in the document, she's calling the white man, Mr. Charlie, Mr. Charlie, right? So there's the kind of allegory and then she's calling the black man, Sam. Um, <laughs> and so this, this account is, she writes it in the mid fifties, but she's talking about an incident in 1931. And 1931 is when she will meet the man that she will ultimately marry Raymond Parks. Um, and one of the things that she says about Raymond Parks, so she will describe Raymond Parks as the first real activist I ever met. But she also will talk about him as not being under the thumb of Mr. Charlie. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I hear there is, and sort of thinking about in terms of men is the kind of precarious position that men were put in because of this kind of climate of rape and sexual violence. And that part of what makes Rosa Parks fall in love with Raymond Parks is this sense that he is not going to be someone who is going to figuratively or literally sort of let this person in the door, mm -hmm. um, no matter kind of what harm it might do. And, and similar to sort of Margaret Garner's husband, right? Of sort of no matter what harm might come to him. Right. Um, but obviously that's a really tricky, difficult um, situation. Right? Um, and both how you do that and how you move forward. Um, Recy Taylor and her husband like will end up splitting up uh, mm -hmm. because I think sometimes this is too, it's too much, right? Yeah, right? So I don't think we can, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot and mm -hmm. it, you know, we can't, you know, what it does to whole families um, I think is is considerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what about? Um, I want to talk even more about resistance. Yeah. Uh, in both, you know. Um, and are there other stories, for example, that you have in the book about Margaret? that you can tell or a couple of stories or about a resistance? Yeah. Well, I just, 
I talk about the layers of resistance okay. and how the murder of her child was the last of several hopeless options. And so the first resistance was to escape. And mm -hmm. then, you know, when she got there, you know, try to fight back physically. And then that was the last of several hopeless options. And so in general, enslaved women, um, you know, in terms of how they resisted rape, like again, because of the laws, because of the powerlessness of their partners and husbands and brothers and fathers uh, and friends, uh, often it was only through their own hands that they were able to resist. In this book that I'm working on now that uh, was mentioned earlier, it's women who, who in some way contributed or participated in armed revolt. And, and a lot of those women, you know, are killing men in their sleep. And, and, and we don't know what the rest of that story is or what led them to stand over the bed of their owner in the wee hours of the night and to hack somebody with an ax mm -hmm. to death. Um, and so it just leaves there are all of these science silences in the narrative, um, not just in my book, but just in the larger tapestry of black women's history. Uh, you just don't have enough because the, the archival record did great damage. Uh, it was trauma and violence committed on a historical record mm. when it comes to black women. And so the record is silent and oftentimes the women themselves were reticent. We know that Harriet Jacobs, a lot of you have read her book in high school, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Okay, so there's always been a debate among historians, what really happened to her? What did uh, this guy do to her? Did he rape her or did he just, you know, uh, speak pornographic thoughts into her, into her ear? And so, you know, all of these things, it just speaks to how difficult it is to to really know, especially in the 19th century when uh, there was so much silence around rape and, and maybe even in the 1940s and 50s mm -hmm. where, I mean, it took a lot of courage for women to speak out. So I argue that even speaking up about it is Absolutely. a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so we don't think of it in our society now. We think, oh, no, you have to go to the police. You got to have a press conference. But we have to, you know, remember that uh, especially in earlier historical moments that speaking about it is radical. It was a radical form of resistance. And so I, I would hope that all of us would, would do well to remember, even as we think about the Me Too, to not lose sight of the women who were in earlier moments did not have a voice or did not have an empathetic audience to hear their story. Can you pick up right. on that? I mean, and what a radical act it is. So with the Reese Taylor case, um, so she is raped coming home from a church meeting right. um, in 1944 by six men who um, tell her that she, they will kill her if she says anything. And she promises not to say anything. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they sort of drop her off. And then almost immediately, she does say something. Right. Um, so the act of saying something and they're, how, they're threatened, um, their house is, one of the places they're staying, their house is burned down. Um, for a time, Rosa Parks and Edie Nixon, who's the head of the Montgomery NAACP, will, will help the, the Taylor family move to Montgomery. They're in Abbeville, but they will move, help them move to Montgomery for a period just because they're in such danger. So, I mean, I think literally speaking is, um, is a radical act, and, and it's particularly a radical act because, I mean, really for this whole expansive history we're talking about, almost up to the present, you cannot expect that there will be justice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So to sort of speak when you know there's not gonna be justice right. um, is, you know, is, is to be able to, you know, kind of imagine something that, that, that we don't yet have, right? Mm -hmm. is, to, is to, so all of these cases um, that, that Rosa Parks and the Montgomery NAACP are working on around sort of trying to get justice for black women who are, so it's not just the Reese Taylor case, there's a woman in 1949, Gertrude Perkins, she's raped by two police officers. Uh, there's a young girl, 
Uh, I think her name is Amanda Lewis. She's raped by one police officer, but none of these cases are there even an indictment, um, let alone some sort of justice. Um, and so one of the things that I've thought about a lot is to sort of understand when we get Rosa Parks in 1955 to the moment, right? She's incredibly burned out by that point, in part mm. because all these cases they've been trying to sort of, um, because they're working on two kinds of cases, I should say. And I think many of the people who are organizing around this see, see sort of the lack of justice for sort of black victims of white brutality and particularly rape and sexual violence is one side of the coin. And then the wrongful accusations against black men, often of, mm -hmm. of sexual crimes, is the other side of the coin. So they're also working on cases like Scottsboro. Mm -hmm. um, there's a case in Montgomery a 16 year old by the name of Jeremiah Reeves, he's having a relationship with a white girl and it gets found out and, um, and she will cry rape and uh, he will ultimately be put to death. Mm -hmm. I mean, he'll be convicted and they fight for years to try to save him from the death penalty and uh, he's, he's killed in 1958. Um, and that case will politicize Claudette Coleman. He goes to the same high school that Claudia Colvin, the 15 year old who is arrested nine months before Rosa Parks. And so she, Colvin will talk about what a politicizing case Jeremiah Reeves is. So, so in many ways, people who are working on these issues, you know, in the thirties, forties and fifties are both imagining something that we don't yet have, right? Mm -hmm. Which is justice, yeah. but it's also understanding that the law is both, um, you know, overly wrongfully and overly accusing some people and then uh and then there's no justice and and so rosa parks talks about sort of just being so bitter and burned out after all these years of trying to sort of um you know they, they're trying to organize around these cases and they're they're not getting anywhere um and so one of the things that's really important about the Emmett Till case is that the attention to that case actually gets an indictment. And so for people like Parks and Nixon and Johnny Carr and that many of the people organizing in Montgomery who had been organizing around the Reese Taylor case and Gertrude Perkins, right, with Emmett Till, it looks like finally there's been enough attention to, to maybe get justice. Um, and one of the things I discovered was Four days before Rosa Parks makes her bus stand, she goes to a huge mass meeting because the lead organizer in the Till case, TRM Howard, has come to Montgomery because the men have just been, you know, have been acquitted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and they're all, I mean, many of the lead organizers, the people who are going to merge as the organizers of the Montgomery Bus Boycott are there that night. And so I, I think you can't understand what what she does four days later and then sort of how how the community is at a breaking point four days later separate from these criminal justice issues mm -hmm. right and what gets people to that point is 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 certainly bus segregation right uh, but is also um, it's also the, the injustice of the criminal justice system and the the kind of raised hopes with Emmett Till that finally enough light had been shined to get an indictment and yet the indictment, like then the two men are acquitted. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Um, how can we um, discuss, I guess, the um, the, imp the collective impact mm -hmm. of this, this crime, this crime that dates to slavery and to the 20th century and of course to now. But um, let's talk first about history um, in terms of, of that, um, that response and just the continued buildup of that frustration to the point to the 20th century where there's some level of, um, well, there's always been resistance, but this level that continues to build. And what is that in terms of um, 
like how we nail that, you know, in terms of concretely how um, women and to some extent men, um, but resist that level of, well, inhumanity, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what it is. And starting with the civil, the, the pre-Civil War days and up until Reese Taylor and in that period. Yeah, I think it takes a little bit of just stepping back and, and seeing the, the common threads. I think the, one of the reasons why I really was excited about this program is that historians of antebellum, which I am, and then 20th century rarely get together to have a discussion about the continuity across time in the lack of change across time and the lack of justice across time right and it's 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 you know it can it, it can be a heavy burden but we must sur soldier forward by amplifying spreading a light on this and having dialogues like this uh, and so uh br building bridges from the past to the present mm -hmm. because in my how i teach at howard you know history is interesting, but if it's not usable, then what is it? We have to make it usable, especially African American history. And so uh, we have to talk about the continuities, the Me Too movement. So many times in my own personal life, I've had male friends uh, when the Bill Cosby uh, allegations first started. Um, and you know, you know, they just necessarily didn't really take it that seriously. And I remember the comments that people leveled when there were black women making the accusation. Same thing with Weinstein. I mean, I think the time where he started to really, the only woman he really resisted, oh, I didn't do that to her, was a black woman. Mm -hmm. And so I, it, it was very troubling to me as a historian to have him, of all these dozens of women, the one that he says, no, I did not do that to her. It was, it was a black woman. And so I said, this, here we go with this, this Jezebel, because I, I heard people say, well, yeah, I don't know if I believe that either. I said, well, why wouldn't you believe that? But you believe, you believe 30 others before it. Right. And so it's just this, and for me, here's that Jezebel thing coming up again, this idea that somehow black women were maybe overly sexual and therefore unrapeable. And, you know, so it's, it keeps rendering its ugly head uh, throughout history. And then this idea that uh, we still remain unprotected, either um, socially in the eyes of the law when it comes to sexual violence. And that's very troubling, um, even as we are trying to tear down the walls of patriarchy. It seems that this wall is <laughs> needs an axe or a hatchet <laughs> or something to, to tear it down. It's, particularly rigid uh, law. So. Um, I mean, I think one of the questions I have is how does it change how we think about like the modern civil rights movement if we see this organizing as being kind of key to it? Um, how does it change how we think about, and again, I like everyone should go and read this account that Rosa Parks writes, the longest piece of personal writing in, in her papers. Um, mm. And it's clearly, whether it's true or a composite or allegory, it is certainly her philosophy of resistance. And so to me, one of the other things that's interesting about it is that she's articulating her philosophy of resistance in the context of like the potential of rape, right? And that, that, and that she is clear there that she is about to fight to the end, right? But that, you know, how she is, uh, you know, it's not about the bus, right? This, mm -hmm. and this, I should say, this document is written probably in the mid fifties, right? So it's very much this key oppression, right? And, and what it does to you. Um, and then what it means then to say, no, I'm not going to stand for this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then this idea of self-defense, right? Because I think that's another thing that we see running through this um, is, so Rosa Parks was a lifelong believer in self-defense. Um, and we see here, one of her beliefs is that you tell people what you're willing to do and that sometimes that protects you. Um, 
and uh, I just sat on the dissertation of a, a great project on black women's self-defense in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I was asking her who else kind of articulated a philosophy like that. And she said Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm. and Fannie Lou Hamer also, both is like her mother um, carries a gun and, uh, and sort of teaches her how to defend herself, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the potential of rape and sexual violence. But also Fannie Lou Hamer is a believer in this idea that you tell people what you're willing to do to them. And then um, I'm going to paraphrase her, but basically she's like, and white people are crazy, but they're not so crazy that they're going to, you know, when you say I'm going to kill you when you come to my house, they often don't come to my house. Right? <laughs> like, you know, and so, so this idea, right, that you're not going to stand for it sometimes protects you and certainly is a, is freedom mm -hmm. in a certain way, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Is I'm not going to, um, in a situation that is that's supposed to make me feel like I have no choice and no freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So today, yeah, we can talk a bit about the Me Too movement um, and where black women fit. Where do you see black women fitting? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I actually want to talk about Joanne Little in 1974, because I think, obviously, that's a high moment. Um, so Joanne Little um, is arrested uh, for some, I can't remember, some sort of burglary, and she's put in jail, and uh, one of her guards comes and basically is trying to force her to give him, uh, like, oral sex. Mm -hmm. And she gets an ice pick and kills him. And it becomes this huge organizing kind of campaign across many black power organizations. And successfully, Joanne Little argues self-defense and is acquitted in 1974 mm -hmm. because in part of all of this organizing. Um, and so I don't think we can think either about kind of the questions Black Lives Matter and Me Too and the kind of overlaps of those without seeing, again, all these long histories, both of people resisting, but also of people sort of uh, linking both the criminal justice system and law enforcement and sexual violence and building these campaigns that sometimes, um, so the idea that you, ha you have the right to self-defense even in jail mm -hmm. um, is, and again, it's not like, then we have that right till today, and ever you know, obviously that's a that's a right that has to be fought for every single time. But right. it's um, I don't know. I was thinking about that in terms of where if we're going to understand that this doesn't just start last year or four years ago. Yeah, I, I think the the powerful thing about the Me Too movement is not that these things were happening. Of course, many of us knew that they were happening. As long as you have unequal power, no matter where you are, it could be a university, a church, a school, as long as you have unequal power and patriarchy, these things happen. But what I like about this movement is that there is so much courage of so many women across the spectrum to speak out. There's a sort of uh, something that's happened with social media where the community has, has gotten more powerful and yes. louder and stronger. And I think it's allowed women who had suppressed things for so long, which is, is typical of people who survive sexual violence is that they, they press it down so long, but now it's bubbling to the surface. And so I think this is, this is good because as individuals, people need to confront uh, what has happened to them and they need to really um, carry forth the the survival mechanism that uh, and collectivize the survival and also the the sense of um, you know fighting for justice for for what had ha has happened to them. So I think it's a, a twenty years from now historians will be writing about this movement and they'll be trying to figure out well what gave what what brought it to the surface and so there you know I think it's a it's a pretty exceptional moment that we're living in and witnessing. Uh, right now, and I think it's gonna only get stronger, mm. and it's gonna 
filter into all sorts of industries, not just the ones we've seen thus far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should we take some questions yeah. from the audience? Oh. oh. Okay. And then second, glad you raised incarceration. How do you think black women who are incarcerated fair with rape today? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's still happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, I mean, you were talking about how your friend was talking about how, how depressing this is. And I think it's, I mean, this, I think this is so hard to talk about and grapple with and sit with and, um, and to keep pressing on, right? Um, and the ways that people, you know, the ways it happens today, the ways that people are made to feel like they're responsible for, you know, whether it's you dressed wrong or you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have gone home, you shouldn't have gone to that party or, um, you should have known that guard was trouble. You should have, you know, this, you know, just all of the ways that these kinds of arguments continue to be made. Um, a slightly more upbeat note to just tell yet another story about Rosa Parks. So when Rosa Parks is arrested that night um, and put in jail, she's put in jail. And there's a woman there um, who is in jail uh, because she'd taken a machete, like her boyfriend was beating her and she picked up a machete to defend herself. Doesn't kill the boyfriend, but, um, and the boyfriend had wanted to get back together with her and she refused. And so she wasn't allowed a call to her family. And so she'd been in there a couple months uh, mm -hmm. and no one knew where she was. And so Rosa Parks smuggles out of jail that night, the woman's brother's phone number and calls him to tell him where she is and then she says like a week or a couple weeks later she actually sees the two of them out and, and the woman is looking better um but just that like um you know one of the things i think we often like silo conversations about sexual violence over here from the ways we talk about and to sort of see that moment that most iconic moment right and that right in that moment is this story of sexual violence and of Rosa Parks still being, I mean, obviously this is an extremely hard night for Rosa Parks, but sort of still being able to think like an organizer and an activist and to, and so to me, um, a little bit that gives us the kind of pathway forward, right? That's just sort of those kinds of solidarities and, and resisting the ways that certain women are deemed like Oh, you must have deserved it, or oh, we don't, you don't, know, and that, like troubling that distinction. Did you want to? Um, and your question is basically how how much are we repeating? Uh, of, of course, uh, we're, we're not suffering from. Well, some of us are. I mean, slavery is rearing its ugly head again mm -hmm. uh, but not in the ways that we think but just because it's not in the ways we think doesn't mean that it's not bad so here again with modern slavery or trafficking black women and brown women and immigrant women again are the most vulnerable and unlike before the ways that that's different is that the slavery itself is underground and so it's hard to know. And so that that's very troubling to me that, um, you know, uh, there are women today who not too dissimilar from Margaret Garner have been purchased for sex. And, you know, um, against and being held against their will. So it's not just prostitution, right? It's sex slavery. 
And so that's happening in America, in my hometown in Toledo, it's happening in Houston, it's happening in Miami. And so that those stories are, it's, that's a little bit harder to unpack because um, unlike uh, then, you know, it's, we're here on emancipation weekend and, and yet we still are troubled by slavery in our capital and, and beyond. So uh, that's a, a broad answer to a very semester long question, I think. <laughs> Thank you for this program. It's overwhelming and heartbreaking and uplifting. So I, I am very interested in the story of the domestic worker and of course the transition from the 19th century to the 20th century. Mm -hmm and especially from like the, the North, the right. South, everywhere, mm -hmm. wherever black women were working right. and the results being, you know, rape, which mm -hmm. was never called. Mm -hmm. And also the results being children yeah. who look like me. Yeah. My grandmother right. was one. Right. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a part of the story that doesn't get told, and it's a part of the story I'm trying to tell, actually. Yeah, it, it, that's, I love that question. It's an important story that definitely needs to be told. A few historians have tried to tell it, uh, but basically, yes, you're still very vulnerable when you're working as a domestic worker. A lot of times these women have to live in a household where they are for the week and then maybe go home on the weekend. And so they're very vulnerable to, in similar ways as they had been during the era of slavery. And so um, the, the difference is they, they could quit and quitting then would, would leave them maybe without the economic resources, but it, quitting then is the form of resistance, which is very different than, you know, you couldn't quit slavery. Right. So, so quitting then, and, and it's something that a lot of times these women, um, if they got impregnated by their uh, employer, you know, then then that's something that then is going to trouble their family, similar to what it did during slavery. So that's something you have to come home, share with your husband, bear a child that bears the mark of, of the employer. And so oftentimes there's a wall of silence, just like it was during the slave era where most of us in this room may have a great great grandmother or great aunt or grandmother who just kept a lot of these secrets and bore this pain silently and these traumas silently and we have clues we have we hear the whispers but it's a truth that's unspoken and that sometimes the only evidence to talk about historians we look for written evidence sometimes the only evidence you see is in the phenotype, the, the skin color, the hair texture. And so, and that's troubling too, but the silence, the incredible silence marked both eras. So that, that's a common thread throughout. The silence of black women, I mean, um, with, with these sexual, uh, these rapes and, and, and how it, it breaks their spirits. It doesn't kill them, but you could definitely tell, you know, uh, you know, my own grandmother's spirit is broken by that. And then, you know, having to love that child. What, I mean, what does it mean to love the child of your rapist? That's the question I talk about in my book. It's something I wouldn't be able to do. But mm. so many black women have done that for hundreds of years. Um, and so that, those are questions that maybe you can answer in your book. Well, it's not a book, an article. An article, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, oh my goodness, that's trying to go so ahead. many questions. So, so many questions. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the economics mm -hmm. of the black female body. Mm -hmm. I think that when we look back at uh, slavery, mm -hmm. uh, that it was calculable. Mm -hmm. One could calculate the value yeah. of a black female body in terms of the number of children yeah. she produced, yeah. the amount of work that those children were able to do on the plantation and the amount of wealth they were able to help sustain yes. Yes. on that plantation. Even into probably the 20th century, the value of the black mm -hmm. female body in terms of the household. Mm -hmm. my, my great aunt 
when I was a child, was a live-in, and she would come home on the weekends, and she would tell us that as a live-in, you were very vulnerable because you slept in the same house that you worked in, and even though the white woman of the household knew that man was sneaking downstairs behind the kitchen at night, economically it was to her benefit not to question or get in the way. And so now we come up to the 21st century where there is a value on the black female body. And I wonder if black women suffer from not understanding their true value, yeah. their economic mm -hmm. value, in terms of what it is that they actually contribute to the overall economic system and why it is that the legal system does not protect them in terms of because you talk about the black woman, her ability to defend herself, but you did not say that there was a major groundbreaking case where a white male has ever been held accountable for the rape of the black woman and the black family and the production of those resources. So I'm wondering if there is any link between Absolutely. the unwillingness to acknowledge the black woman as having value and the ongoing rape of her to con even into the 21st century in different ways mm -hmm. to convince her that she does not have value and it, how she internalizes that. I don't know if that's a question. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very powerful question. And I personally, I kind of don't necessarily like to put values on black women's bodies because sometimes it lends itself to commodification, which is something we've been trying to get away from. But your question though is very powerful for this reason. Um, I argue in my book, and I'm sure other historians have as well, that this man who owned Margaret Garner was a yeoman farmer. Uh, yeoman farmers only had five, five, ten slaves. He had less than six, I think. And through her womb, he became one of the top 10% in that county, through wow. her womb alone. Wow. And when she left, it wasn't just, oh, I like her, she's a nice person, let me go get her. When she left, she uh, took her fertility with her. Right. She took four children with her, one in the womb. This woman, from the time she was 16, had had a child every year. Mm. So she was at the height of her productivity. But I argue in a profound way, in no uncertain terms, that his wealth and standing was directly tied to her fertility. And so, um, and, and then, you know, in terms of the, the, the values, there's a, a scholar by the name of Dinah Ramey Berry, who wrote a really genius book. Uh, it was called Pound, what is it, Pound of Flesh. Flesh yeah. And it's about, um, she she's also has some misgivings about the uh, value, how much a black woman was worth at this age versus my age, where she's practically worthless because she can no longer produce. <laughs> But she says black women, the ways that they, there's something, she, she comes up with a new phrase called soul value. So although I may not be able to have children, I'm still very valuable to my family, to my community. And so that value was priceless, right? And so I, that's why I really like that question. It allows us to get at all these different uh, things that really have to do with, um, you know, uh, wealth in this country, how it was built on whose we always say, oh, the wealth was built on the blacks at the backs of black people. We say that, right, in flippant ways. Oh, the wealth of this nation was built on the backs of black people. But I would say it was built in the wombs of black women. Okay? And so that's a different thing to say. It makes people say, oh, okay, in the conversation, she's going on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, just that. Part of what defines U.S. slavery different from slavery in the rest of the Western Hemisphere is that is reproduction, mm -hmm. right? Like no, in no other country is reproduction at the center of the way that slavery um, so works. So in the United States, reproduction is like the I don't know how to say this like. Um, is central to the way the institution works. Mm -hmm. It's not as central in other parts of the Americas. Um, and it's why we can have a constitution that enshrines slavery and um, abolishes the slave trade in 1808. 
because because they know already that yeah. it's about that 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 the pressure and the the fulcrum is going to be on black women's reproduction right um mm -hmm. and so there were like so many there are so many questions oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah here and there was like oh. here 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 yes yeah. so i have a question about um or i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about black girls um knowing that um sexual violence doesn't just begin when you turn 18 um what maybe some stories or some um how did it differ with children um and I guess maybe some stories in relation to this being something that you grew up experiencing um, all the way through adulthood as well. Um, so one of the women who's very active in the Mississippi movement, um, her name is Indisha Idame Holland, and she wrote this book called From the Mississippi Delta. And she talks in there both about being raped on her 14th birthday or 12th birthday, but also how this was true for many of her friends and she talks about how most of them didn't tell their parents. Mm. Um, and so just going back to our, like what we were talking about in terms of domestic work, both the vulnerability, um, not just of grown women, but of teenage girls mm -hmm. in these houses, and then the ways that both to protect their families mm -hmm. that most of them didn't tell. And, and I would say for the slave era, um, it, it's really sad, you know, to, to just, when you give birth, as an enslaved woman, to give birth to a female child and to, and to, to intuitively know and understand that you can't protect or guarantee this child's innocence or her virginity until the day she's married. And so it, it's really part of socializing, uh, socializing your female children, and, and so many historians have written on this, is slave mothers had to socialize their, their daughters to be weary of certain of the owner's sons, to watch out for the owner when he's acting this way. And so that's something we don't, we can't even really comprehend in our, day, in our lives right now, um, to think that this was, you know, part of a rites of passage for these girls to get socialized in this way. Uh, we also know as historians that um, sometimes uh, the owner's sons would learn how to have sex through their slave women that, the, that their fathers owned. And so the, it was a rites of passage for uh, the owner's sons as well to learn everything they needed to know about sex through having a, an encounter and it wasn't consensual, obviously, an encounter with their enslaved women. We know that by 14, during the slave era, generally that's around the time that a lot of these young girls would lose their in, in, innocence. In terms of the stories that you said, or that you asked about, there's a really powerful story um, in a book entitled Celia, a Slave by Milton McLaurin. And in that book, he says that this white guy, his, um, you know, he's not married. I think his wife had died, you know, before. So he goes to a market, a slave market, purchases a 14-year-old girl. On the way back to his plantation, he rapes her. And then he proceeds to have kids with her. And she, you know, eventually by the time she's an adult, she's had several kids, she finds a love of her own. She says, can you stop messing with me? These are my words. Can you leave me alone? And he's like, no, I'll see you tonight. And so she gets fed up, her, the, her uh, beloved, the, the guy that she really loved, who was an, another black, a, a black man, says, well, if you don't do something about it, you know, then it's over. So she decides what she was gonna do about it was to kill her owner. So she killed him and chopped up his body, burned him up in a fire and had his grandson <laughs> remove the ashes from the fireplace. Hmm. So it's like, you know, and so some people say, oh, well, that was horrible. How could she do that? I'm like, hey, did you forget that this was a 14 year old girl who was purchased for sexual purposes and raped on the way home from that purchase and had to bear children, as I said before. And so it's a 
very, very powerful book. And like mine, it's a very short read. So I would encourage you, it's an older book, but just as powerful as the day it was uh, published in my, in my mind. Um, actually two things. Um, and to kind of piggyback on what you were saying about um, she was writing back mm -hmm. with this man. There's a book called um, The Capital in Black and White. Mm -hmm. And there's a, and it, um, it's about the um, Senator, the Senate Mater D. Are you familiar with yeah. that book? Okay. Because in it, he's talking, and I think this happened maybe in the 30s. He's talking about his father and sister are riding back mm -hmm. from somewhere and they're riding in this wagon. Mm -hmm. Then his wife boss stops them. And he says, um, you come with me. Mm -hmm. to the, she's maybe 15 years old. And so, so the father's like, no, man, no, you know. So no, -uh, you come with me. So the father can only protests a few times. Mm -hmm. She goes with him. He rapes her. Yeah. Her father's sitting right there. Mm -hmm. He's sitting right there. You know, the trauma, mm -hmm. you know, and there's so many la layers to mm -hmm. that, the horror of that. Of, of how she has to endure this monster, the savage monster violating her, and her father is there. But there are so many things that were happening in this society, and it was in the South, that if that father defended her, that the grisly handiwork that black people had seen white people do behind defying yeah. th this man, I mean, it could have meant he's lynched. It could have meant, and not just him, his, the whole community, exactly. the whole black community. So she walks back to her, to this, um, to her father. You know, she walks back to the, to the wagon. I can, because I think about my father, what, you know, and, and I think, you know, there are the deacons of justice mm -hmm. who are like picking up the gun. They're about picking yeah. up the gun, you know? So, and I, but I'm thinking, so there's a lot that he, that she endured and, and her rage at this man, at this white man who, who, you know, raped her, but her own father. And what that does to just snuff out love between black people that, yeah. in, and when she gets home, you know, because, you know, and, and because she can't, it's hard to temper that. How do you temper that? My father did not do anything, you know, but not taking into account that your whole neighborhood could have been destroyed right. behind this one, you know, if he defied him. But, but in, and the shame of the father, here's my girl coming back. I didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything to protect her. And he goes home and that family is sitting at that, that kitchen table and that mother is looking at that husband and saying, you know, and trying to, you know, make sense of it and trying to, reconcile the fact that you could have been killed we all could have been killed or you know the whole neighborhood but trying to make sense of that and the heart and how does that daughter process that how does she process it or even the slave women that somebody can grab you at any second the terror that lived in their hearts from moment to moment somebody can just grab you at any moment take you off and rape you every day as many times a day, what did that feel like? You know, so that that's my comment. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Really powerful. And I guess I'll just stay seated so everybody can see. But um, thank you both all, uh, again for uh, for coming. I, I along the same lines, I have a question, and that is um, throughout history there. When you talk about dismantling patriarchy, I, I, I'm a firm believer that patriarchy extreme, taken to its extremes, the extremes that we have now um, and have had throughout our society, hurt men as well as hurt women. And, and what this lady just described is a, a prime example of that, where, where everything that we have learned about what it means to be a man in certain instances are removed from us. Um, and, uh, and even things that we, we have, have been taught as we come you know, across the, the oceans and through time, uh, 
even leads us sometimes to be perpetrators of the evils that, that uh, we hate on many levels. So both of you perhaps could give some sort of uh, insight, but where, how can we bring ourselves forward to help black women uh, as far as these atrocities and, and moving our entire society mm -hmm. into uh, a better millennium? I mean, I don't, I don't know if other people have been struck by this, but one of the hardest things I think about this Me Too moment is how much, as we begin to have a conversation, how many people have been raped like as I mean that in this moment where we're finally starting to talk about it, um, one of the things that I've been really struck by is how many women have had this experience. Um, how many women have had it at work? How many women have had it in their like private spaces, whether they're family spaces or romantic spaces? Um, and how to talk about that, right? And how to just how common it still is um and and just as a professor just having so many students come and tell me these stories of and you know and what what you would do like what how we like counsel young women in terms of how to move forward through those experiences um and just um so this is not really an answer it's more a question on your question which is that i've been feeling like um both this incredible courage and like this, that the, this Me Too movement is opening questions in a much different way, but also just, I feel like I've been really struck by just how huge and broad and how many young women and middle-aged women and older women, right, have had these experiences and then. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's at least a weekly thing in my office. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's never happened before, and I think it's just the moment that we're in. Uh, we're professor of Black women's history becomes therapist um, for sexual violence, and um, and it, it's 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 so much. And sometimes the weight of those stories, on top of the the stories that I teach, I mean, I come home and I'm just so tired. Yeah. Um, and it's a heavy burden. So I think men must be in the room. They have to be present in the room. Men have to help us reclaim our bodies and give us the power, allow us to have the power to say, this is my body. You have no right to take from me that which is mine. So men have to be in the room. They have to join the dialogue. They have to hear these stories. And they have to understand that that our bodies belong to us, and um, and our voices will not be silenced. And so, so I think that's important. I think um, uh, that that's the biggest contribution I think men can make to this: um, not silencing us, not blaming us, not as some people would say, slut shaming us for well, what were you dressed like? I never asked my students that um i'm horrified that these things are happening on our college campuses and it's not always by other students right no. professors people with power can sometimes abuse that power and that's at every university that i've been at and sometimes it's not always men that abuse that power, other women. And that is really, that was hard for me to process. And so I don't wanna leave this thing, oh, men, 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 men. This is power and how it, it's dangerous and pernicious, and especially when it's unchecked, when you have the intersections of this power and patriarchy and racism, it's just a, a toxic stew that's looking for victims. And unfortunately, whether they be 14-year-olds or 18-year-olds away from home, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, not all the times our women who come to campuses, they're not always empowered. 
And you would think, oh, they're off at college, they're 600 miles away from home. A lot of these young women have never had direction at home from their women folk. Uh, direction about how do you find your voice if your professor is saying these things? What resources do you have? Who do you go tell? What is Title IX? And why is it my best friend if I'm a female student? And so, um, sorry, that's a very long meandering. <laughs> Um, yes, I wondered this since I was young. Um, I actually have four questions, but I'm going to ask this one that I've often wondered about. How can these so-called, in many cases, Christian religion white men, and back then black slaves were viewed as anim animals, subhuman, how could they rape black women, black girls, say on a Saturday night, and then go to church the next morning, when technically, if they viewed them as animals and subhuman, that was bestiality. So I've always wondered how, what was their justification? <laughs> yeah, um, there are so many hypocrisies uh, in the historical record powerful Christian. My guy in my book was a Christian, a respectable member of his Presbyterian uh, congregation. And um, and so, yeah, that, that uh, doesn't necessarily, as we all know, um, lots of demons found in the church, right? And so, uh, or the mosque or, or whatever other religious body. So, so I think that um, in terms of, uh, I think they were very aware of the contradiction. So sometimes I think we, we think, oh, well, maybe they weren't aware of the contradiction. So you have somebody like uh, Thomas Jefferson um, writing, you know, when he's writing the Declaration and all of these words about freedom. And, and so it, it seems that, oh, you know, my students say, well, maybe he wasn't aware of, of what, you know, then I show them the omitted passage of the Declaration, and so there goes that theory, right? And then you you look at the his notes on the state of Virginia. Have you all read that? And so he's he's like at the beginning stages of this scientific racism. We now call it scientific racism, where he's outlining all the different ways that black people smell and black women uh, or orangutans are attracted to black women and all of these things. And we know that he's Firing children with his with Sally, yeah, with Sally Hemings, and so it's like the, it's like you know, you know, I it's it's you know uh, common. I think we still can see that today with you know a lot of our uh, politicians, and, yeah, who you know, or even religious leaders who who have these kinds of, and I think they're they're very much aware of of the hypocrisy. And um, and they chose to to put that forward in the public sphere um, because you know it, it justified you know holding slaves. It was a powerful. I mean, the Christian Church was you know Catholic Church from the beginning of time um, was a, was complicit in the transatlantic slave trade and in slavery continuing slavery and so we have to confront that now i've never been to a church that confronted that yeah. i joined that church mm, i would so that that's a, that's a that's a very powerful question thank you okay so we have time for one more question but please feel free to stick around and have some informal conversation so constant theme through history has been denial mm -hmm. and whiteness. They work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So coming forward to the Me Too moment, movement, hopefully, how do you break down the walls that uh, white, white feminism, black feminism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the things we have to, one of the things I worry about with this, with the way that the Me Too movement has 
aspects of it is that it's about holding up these like uber horrible guys like Harvey Weinstein, who seemingly was an uber horrible guy. But then all the people around, men and women, who allowed him to be what he did, mm -hmm. um, the kind of slut shaming that happens not just by men, but by women, right? That like, mm -hmm. that I, I worry that if we don't have a bigger conversation about sort of all the ways that, and all the ways people participate in this, right? Which is not to say that it's the same as doing what Harvey Weinstein did, right? But Harvey Weinstein can only exist if lots of people right. are silent or if lots of people are saying, well, look how she dressed. Look, she went to his, you know, she went to his room. She went to this. She wanted this, right? Um, and, and so to, to have a more structural conversation about the, the kind of ways that, um, the silences of many of us, right? Um, the ways that sometimes we cut corners, right? So you don't wanna like, you know, people are sitting around joking or people, you don't wanna be the person who seems shrill or seems like, you know, and I think, um, so to me, one of the questions going forward is how to have that bigger conversation. Um, because I think sometimes the way that this is preceded is like, oh, I'm not him. Right, as if it didn't take a lot of people to make possible what he did. Mm -hmm. I think it's important too. There's a class dynamic that I think is being ignored. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes the people who are brought to the media's attention yeah. are people who have hooked up with powerful attorneys who then serve as their advocates. And what about the young black girl at McDonald's, right? What about uh, somebody working as a caregiver in somebody's home and their adult son is there with them? You know, and so there are all these other things that we have to, you know, we have to add these other voices in the class dynamic um, to this narrative. Or, or I think black women, brown women, Latinas will be alienated from a movement that just you know, uh, we have the actresses, but yeah, not many of us are in that sphere. Right. So, uh, but we do have equally, if not more horrific things that really boil down to us not being able to eat if we don't go to a certain job. Right. So those stories need to be brought to the surface. I'm not sure how, but I always lament that it's always a powerful victim, so to speak. I mean, we would call them survivors, but they're they're powerful or strategically poised to to, yeah. to really have a bigger voice yeah. to the detriment of, of people who are just you know living and working and working two jobs they can't afford to lose the second one you have a boss that has raped them or or whatever else and so those stories you know just are being erased and this is a problem for a historian 100 years from now people wonder well where were there no black women in, in Latino and Native women dealing with any of this. So all we see are these women who spoke on CNN. And so that, that's, the, that's the danger, I think. Please help me give them a round of applause for a wonderful conversation. And we have books outside, so come on outside and get your books signed and continue the conversation with these wonderful scholars. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye.